All right. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, to the DDPS seminar. Uh, before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. Uh, first of all, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. If you have questions, you are welcome to unmute and ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences. Um, therefore, no classified discussion is allowed, so please watch out. Uh, finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our uh, YouTube channel. That's about it. Now, let me introduce our uh, speaker today. Um, it is a, an honor and it's my pleasure, uh, especially because um, uh, today's speaker, I know uh, very well uh, um, uh, who is Masayano. Uh, uh, he is a assistant professor in the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies. Uh, he obtained his bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Georgia Tech, master's degree in computation for design and optimization from MIT, and PhD in aerospace computational engineering from um, MIT. His research interests lie in the development and assessment of numerical methods for PDEs with emphasis on adaptive high order uh, methods, error estimation, model reduction, and data assimilations. Um, I know he's giving a uh, very, uh, very good talk, so uh, you can anticipate uh, a wonderful talk from Masa. Uh, today, Masa will talk about four reliable, efficient, and automated model reduction of parameterized nonlinear PDEs, uh, error estimation, adaptivity, uh, and application to aerodynamics. All right. Um, uh, now, without further ado, let me pass the button to Masa by asking one random question as usual. Uh, today's random question is, what is your favorite things to do other than research, Masa? Other uh, than research and teaching, I, I guess. I, <laughs> I, I, teach, fair, yeah. fair enough. I actually enjoy playing tennis quite a bit. Uh, so oh. yeah, so that's oh. that's my- uh, I, love, I love tennis too. We, we should play sometime. Oh, we should uh, play sometime when, when we have uh, yeah. in-person meetings at some point. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, the stage are yours, Masa. Okay, so young Su, thank you very much for the invitation to give a talk here. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, so today, as young Su said, I'm going to talk about our work towards reliable, efficient, and automated model reduction of parameterized nonlinear PDEs. And recurring themes for this talk will be error estimation, adaptation, and application to aerodynamics. Now, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of my students Jeff, Eugene, Ben, Adrian, and Michael. Uh, what I'm going to present here is really a product of their work. I would also like to acknowledge the financial support provided by Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Canada Foundation for Innovation, and Synet, which provide computational resources. So in today's talk, we'll be looking at parameterized partial differential equations. So these are problems where we start with a set of parameters mu, and then given the parameter, we compute the state u of mu, and then given the state, we evaluate the outputs s of mu. For example, in aerodynamics, parameter could describe flight condition, like angle of attack and Mach number. It can also describe shape, things like span, cord, or even airfoil geometry. And also model parameters, for example, associated with turbulence models. And then given these set of parameters that describe the problem, we want to compute the state, velocity, pressure, density, and so on. And then ultimately evaluate the quantities of interest or outputs, things like lift, drag, and moment on aerodynamic body. Now, we would like to solve these parameterized problems in many query scenarios. So here we are thinking about scenarios like parameter sweep, where we might want to understand the aerodynamic performance for various Mach number and angle of attack, design and optimization, where we change the shape to see how that affects the performance of the product and optimize it. 
and uncertainty quantification, where we want to quantify, say, the effect of variability in the input on the quantities of interest, and also scenarios like unsteady flow prediction, where we might want to, say, perform flow control by solving this class of problem in real time. Now, one thing that all of these problems have in common is that they typically require hundreds or even possibly millions of simulations. So if we try to use standard CFD method, it can become too expensive. So we want to accelerate the solution of these many query problems significantly. Now, one way to do that is to use surrogate models. So here, goal is to construct reliable and efficient PD-informed surrogate models. Now, one such method that we're going to talk about is projection-based reduced order models or the ROMs. The idea is quite simple. In what's called offline stage, we are going to obtain the solutions for training parameters and then construct a surrogate model. So in the middle, I'm showing the parameter domain. We basically sample the parameter space and then create a reduced order model. In the online stage, once you have that ROM, we can invoke that for any parameter values. So go from the parameter mu to state u of mu to the output. And we can do this um, for parameter values that are not typically in the training set. So our goal here is to basically create a surrogate model such that the types of simulation that might require a, say, a supercomputer can be performed on something like a laptop. Now, in terms of mathematical problem we are looking at, it, here's the general formula of the parameterized PD. So we start with a parameter mu that lies in a p-dimensional space. And given that we found a state u of mu that satisfies, say, a conservation law, things like Navier-Stokes equations or Reynolds averaged Navier-Stokes equations. We then evaluate the output s of mu, again, things like lift, drag, and moment. Now, there are many parameterized PDs out there. In this talk, we are going to focus on aerodynamic flows because they are complex in the following sense. So they exhibit severe nonlinearity. They also exhibit convection dominance. They exhibit wide range of scales in a sense that things like boundary layers are so much smaller than the size of an aerodynamic body. They also exhibit limited regularity, things like shocks. So all of these features makes aerodynamic flows complex. And what we would like to do is to accelerate the solution of these types of problems. So here's our goal. We would like to enable model reduction for these complex PDEs and be able to go from parameter to state to output in rapid, reliable, and automated manner. Now, when I say rapid, what I mean is that we want to provide orders of magnitude online computational reduction such that we can solve these many query problems efficiently. At the same time, we also care about offline training cost. We want it to be efficient such that we can use it in the practical engineering settings. When I say reliable, what I mean is that we want to provide a quantitative online error estimate in predictive setting. So we want such an error estimate to be very fast so that we, it can evaluate error estimate in the time it takes to evaluate the ROM itself, and also work in predictive setting in the sense that it works for parameter values that it wasn't trained for. And in the offline stage, we want to use such an error estimate to adaptively control various sources of error. And finally, we want the entire process to be automated such that it requires minimum user intervention or problem-specific tuning. Now, before we dive into how we approach this problem, I'd like to provide a high-level overview of approximation hierarchy. So as I mentioned, our goal is to solve parameterized PDE. And parameterized PDE, of course, the solution lies, in a sense, in an infinite dimensional space. Now, in practice, we approximate the solution to this problem by using a full order model, where the solution is approximated in the NH dimensional space. For a typical CFD simulation, an age might be in order of a million or so. Now, reduced order model is further reduction of that full order model, where the reduced order space might be of order of 10 to 100 degrees of freedom. But looking at this approximation hierarchy, what this means is that if in order to construct an accurate ROM, we in fact 
have to control the error associated with each one of these approximations and also estimate error in order to control the error. So the picture I would like you to keep in mind is a total error in a reduced order model is a sum of the full order model error and the reduced order model error. And ideally, what we would like to be able to do is that user provide the problem description and target tolerance and automatic algorithm should basically choose appropriate full order model and reduced order model such that we can achieve that error tolerance. And that's what we would like to do. So as a first step, I would like to focus on the control of the full order model error. To do this, we'll be using adaptive high order method. So in particular, we will be using discontinuous Galakin method. So DG method approximates a solution in the NH dimensional piecewise polynomial space, like the one shown on the bottom right. And given this space, we seek a solution view of H that satisfies the DG residual statement, um, which involves integration over elements as well as facet. And given the solution, we evaluate the output. Now, there are many discretizations out there, but DG methods have a number of attractive features, including prov providing stability for conservation laws, working with unstructured meshes such that we can mesh complex geometries, and also perform adapt or support adaptive mesh refinement in an easy manner. And this last piece is going to play a crucial role as we try to control the error associated with the full order model. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how this is done. And here the key is that we want to control the error associated with the output. So the quantities of interest, things like lift and drag. And in that context, not all errors and residuals are important. Some errors or some residuals play more important role in computing quantities of interest. And one way to understand that is to solve a dual problem. So on the bottom left, I'm showing you an example of the dual solution we might obtain for aerodynamic flow. And what this tells us is the sensitivity of the output to the residual committed in the various region of the flow. So by weighing our residual with this dual solution, we can come up with an error estimate for the quantity of interest. And that is called dual weighted residual error estimate because residual is weighted by the dual. We can also localize this statement to get an elemental error indicator like the one shown on the right. So in this particular figure, what we see is that for this particular mesh, we have actually a lot of error coming from the lack of boundary layer resolution for computing the drag in this case. Once we know the error is large, we can refine the mesh to control the error. And we can keep refining until user prescribed error tolerance is met. Now I'd like to talk a little bit more about exactly how this adaptation process work. So this is an iterative procedure. We solve a problem on a given mesh, estimate the error, mark the elements for refinement, and then actually refine the elements. As I mentioned, the solution is obtained using the discontinuous Galakin method. The estimation is performed using dual weighted residual formulation. Now, in terms of marking, we not only want to know which elements to refine, but we also want to understand how to refine those elements. So for example, you know, you can refine the element in an isotropic manner by splitting it vertically or horizontally or in isotropic manner. And this type of anisotropic refinement can be quite important for aerodynamic flows, which has many anisotropic features. So let's take a look at how this particular method works. So throughout this talk, I'm going to be using this flow of our Onera M6 wing as an example. So the governing equation is a Reynolds averaged Navier-Stokes equation. Here are the flow parameters. I'm first going to solve this problem using a kind of a best practice mesh we might use in aerospace engineering and using a piecewise linear P1 approximation, which corresponds to a second order method. And I'm going to see how much um, refinement is required to reach 0.5% error level. So I'm going to target 0.5% because eventually we are going to split overall error into 0.5% for the full order model and 0.5% for the reduced order model to achieve the total error of 1%. So here is a convergence plot 
of the CD error against the number of degrees of freedom using this second order method on a sequence of best practice meshes without adaptation. And it requires about 33 million degrees of freedom to achieve the target error level. Now, if we perform adaptation, we can reduce that quite significantly, about 5.5 million degrees of freedom, so about a factor of six reduction. We can reduce this further by using high order method, so using not piecewise linear polynomial, but higher order polynomials. And when we do that, we get this error history. So for P2 through four, that corresponds to third order to fifth order method, the number of degrees of freedom required to achieve that 0.5% error level goes down to about 0.5 to 0.85 million degrees of freedom, or on roughly the factor of 65 reduction compared to second order mesh, a second order approximation on best practice meshes. So the key takeaway here is that adaptive high order methods are very efficient. And this is actually quite important in the context of reduced order modeling as well, because we still have to train these models. So we want to solve each one of these problems efficiently, such that in the offline stage, we can perform this calculation um, in a, in a more quickly than what would be required. If we just use a second order method. Okay. So that's basically what we are going to be using for full order model. Now the question is that we want to develop a model reduction method that works well for this adaptive high order method. And here is the formulation. Our starting point is the selection of reduced spaces. I think this is idea that have come up many, many times in these DDPS seminars. So the idea here is to replace these finite element polynomial space with empirical or tailored spaces. And these spaces can be obtained, for example, by applying POD or PCA on a set of snapshots. Orthogonal basis we obtain might look like what is shown on the bottom. So this basis basically captures the parametric variation in the solution um, as the parameters are varied. Now, once we find such a low dimensional space, we can use Galakin projection to find the solution to the problem. Now, one caveat here is that even though we've reduced the dimension of the space, the computation of this residual still requires all the NH operation because we still have to evaluate the residual all over the mesh to compute this reduced residual. Now, one way to reduce this is to use hyperreduction. So we are going to accelerate our residual evaluation using a hyperreduction procedure. There are many hyperreduction procedures out there uh, one particular method we are going to use uh, is called element-wise reduced quadrature method. So the idea here is that instead of evaluating the residual on every single element, we are going to evaluate it in a very small subset of elements okay? so that we can evaluate this residual quickly. Now we want to choose these reduced quadrature weights carefully such that we can provide both sparsity and accuracy. So sparsity simply means that very small fraction of the elements are selected. Now, accuracy means that we want to make sure that error in the output due to the use of this hyper-reduced residual is small. So we have to somehow control the error due to hyper-reduction. And here we can, again, appeal to this idea of dual weighted residual. So use of hyper-reduced uh, residual in introduces some error in the residual calculation, but we can try to find a set of weights that minimizes such error and still achieve sparsity. So the procedure we use to actually compute that su such a weight is called empirical quadrature procedure. So here, basically the user prescribes the tolerance on the quantity of interest. And then we have an algorithm that is going to seek a set uh, of weights that minimizes the number of non-zero subject to three constraints, including in having non-negative weights, being making sure that it accurate, uh, accurately integrates constant weights, and also satisfying the condition about residual matching. So what the residual matching means is that even though we are approximating this residual using this reduced set of weights, we want to make sure that residual is accurate on the set of training parameter set. Now, we can solve this problem 
and the solution has a number of attractive properties. So first of all, the ways that we find R sparse, which is good, so that we can evaluate these hyper-reduced models uh, efficiently. Second is that it provides error control. Under mild assumptions, we can prove that error due to this use of hyper-reduced residual is controlled to user prescribed tolerance. And third, computationally, set of constraints becomes linear, and this can be solved efficiently using modified parallel non-negatively squares algorithm. And lastly, algorithm is quite versatile so that we can replace this residual matching, con matching constraints to hyper-reduce various forms and construct things like error estimate, um, solving the unstudy problems and so on. And I will demonstrate this later in the talk. So let's revisit this Onera M6 example and see how it works. So this time around, the problem is parameterized. We are still solving Reynolds average Navier Stokes equation, but we have certain variation in the Mach number as well as angle of attack. Reynolds number is fixed at 1 million. In terms of error tolerance, we are going to allocate 0.5% for full order model and 0.5% for the reduced order model. So on the left, I'm showing you the result for using the adaptive DG method. This is basically a summary of the early graph that we show. And what we see is that in general, as the order of approximation increases from second order to fifth order, or p equals one, p equals four, number of degrees of freedom required to achieve 0.5% accuracy goes down. Number of elements also goes down significantly. And so does the computational time. So adaptive high order method enables efficient offline training. Now, in terms of the reduced model constructed, this is what we observe. So for this particular problem, turns out we only need about 12 degrees of freedom. About 100 elements are marked after hyper reduction. But notice that computational time on the laptop goes up from about 31 seconds to about 250 seconds. And in particular, the speed up relative to the original full order model, in fact, decreases as we use higher order approximation. So somehow this method becomes increasingly less efficient when we consider higher order approximation. And this is not so good because we wanted to create a method that works well with high order approximations. And the reason for this slowdown is actually twofold. So first of all, more computation is required per element for higher order approximation, at least for DG methods, because it involves more quadrature points per element. Second one is that there are fewer number of elements to reduce. So these two meshes I'm showing you here achieves about the same amount of error. Left is second order approximation, right is the fifth order approximation. They have about 0.5% um, drug tolerance, but uh, um, there are basically far fewer elements for the higher order discretization, which is good from the full order model computation point of view. But in terms of reduction, this means that there are much fewer opportunities to actually reduce the problem. So a key takeaway here is that this element-wise reduced quadrature is not well suited for this high order DG approximation. And in fact, this limitations also applies to other algebraic or discrete hyperreduction methods. So how can we fix this problem? Now, one idea is to work with quadrature points instead of elements. So instead of decomposing the residual in terms of elements, we are going to decompose it further into the level of the quadrature points, which are shown in blue and red on the right figure. And we are going to use this as a single unit when we construct our hyper-reduced residual. The rest is identical. So we are still going to try to approximate the residual using this hyper-reduced residual, but approximations are applied at quadrature point level. And this is shown pictorially on the bottom right figure. So the gray dots correspond to the original quadrature points. And we are selecting a very small subset of those points to compute the, uh, to compute the reduced order model. The algorithm for finding these points are identical as before. So we try to minimize the number of non-zero, subject to non-negativity, constant accuracy, and residual matching conditions. So now let's revisit how this particular method works. Exactly the same method as before. On the left, again, I summarize the result for adaptive DG method. 
This time around, I also add the number of quadrature points. So quadrature points varies from about 27 million points to about 3 million points for this Onera M6 problem. We've already seen the result for element-based reduced quadrature. Basically, the time goes up as the, as the polynomial degree goes up. With the pointwise method, we use a little more points than the number of elements that was used. But in terms of computational time, the computational time becomes independent of the polynomial degree that was used to approximate the solution. So what this guy achieves is p-independent cost. And also, it is significantly faster than element-wise method, a factor of about 70,000 speed up in terms of CPU time. Now, you might be worried that reducing tens of millions of degree um, quadrature points to just hundreds of quadrature points might require you know, significant training cost because the optimization problem is large, but it turns out this training cost is only about 30 to 70% of a single DG solve on the final adapted mesh. So this doesn't really cause a significant issue um, in terms of the uh, offline training. So we are quite happy with this particular method. So this is what we are going to use to construct the ROM. Now, one issue I haven't really addressed is error estimation and control. Now, so far what we have done is to create a ROM with efficient offline training and online evaluation. And that was a product of combining adaptive high order DG method, reduced spaces, and pointwise reduced quadrature. So our next goal is to equip this ROM with an estimate of the output error. So we would like to be able to basically compute the error between the full order model and the reduced order model in online efficient manner in predictive setting. So both of these was uh, important. So online efficient means that evaluation cost for computing this error estimate is comparable to just evaluating the ROM. And predictive means that this error estimate has to work even if that model is not trained for that particular parameter value. And then once we have such an error estimate, we want to control the error between full order model and reduced order model in the automated manner. So I'd like to talk about error estimation first. So we use the same ingredients that we, that we use to construct an error estimate for the full order model. So namely the dual weighted residual method. The only difference here is that we are going to approximate the solution to the dual problem using reduced spaces as well. So just as a short recap, the idea is that we solve the primal or the flow problem. We compute this dual solution, and then by combining them, we can come up with an error estimate for the quantity of interest. So that's what we are going to do. Now, one caveat here is that, again, the solution of the dual problem also requires the evaluation of the residual. So we have to hyper-reduce that as well. And we use exactly the same technique, the empirical quadrature procedure with a different set of constraints, such that we can also accelerate the evaluation of this error estimate. And this is an error estimate that can be evaluated in an online efficient manner. Once we have such an error estimate, we can actually automate the training of the reduced order, reduced order model. So as a starting point, basically user is going to supply the output tolerances for finite element and reduced basis approximation. And then the algorithm is going to create a reduced order model that meets user specified tolerance. And the idea is the following. Let's say we first use just single dot to compute the um, construct a ROM. And then using that one DOF ROM, we are going to evaluate error estimate at a whole bunch of points in the parameter space. We are going to find a point where the ROM performs the poorest and then compute the finite element solution at that point. We are going to perform adaptive mesh refinement at that point as necessary, such that snapshot is accurate. We then update the reduced spaces and retrain these reduced quadrature rules using empirical quadrature procedure. And then we basically keep adding points. Every, every iteration, we basically probe the part of the parameter space that is least well approximated as informed by this error estimate and then keep adding points until the user prescribed error tolerance is met for all of the training points. 
So that's how this simultaneous finite element, reduced spaces, and reduced quadrature greedy training procedure work. And going back to the initial discussion of the approximation hierarchy, what this method is really trying to do is to control all three sources of the error associated with the finite element approximation. So this comes from the finite mesh, reduced spaces error, which comes from the use of finite reduced spaces, and reduced quadrature error, which comes from the use of the reduced quadrature rule. And we have a mechanism for controlling each of these three sources of error, and also a mechanism for estimating these sources of error. So this enables automatic construction of the ROM in the sense that we provide problem description and users specify the target error tolerance for the quantity of interest, say 1% on lift or drag. And then the algorithm is going to automatically train the finite element space, reduced spaces space, and reduced quadrature to create a certified ROM. I put certified here in quotes because we don't have error bounds. These are simply estimates, um, but we'll see how these methods work. So let's revisit this on M6 problem again. So we have two parameters, angle of attack and Mach number. Reynolds number is fixed. And as a user, I'm going to provide a geometry and say that I want surrogate model to achieve 1% error level. And at this point, the algorithm takes over and first going to basically perform adaptive mesh refinement to make sure that all of the snapshots meets the user prescribed error tolerance um, in terms of the uh, drug error. And I'd like to again emphasize that these high order adaptive methods are quite a bit more efficient than just using second order method on best practice measures. So that's how we control the finite element error now, in terms of the reduced spaces error, this is what we observe in terms of the error estimate against the number of basis function. So in that greedy iteration where we keep adding more nodes, or sorry, more training points, basically error goes down as we add more training points. We terminate after adding a ninth point. Number of degrees of freedom goes down from about 1.1 million to nine. A number of quadrature points goes down from 6.3 million to about 153. Now we can test this method on a set of test points which are different from the training set. And here is what we observe. So blue line here corresponds to the actual error computed at the set of test points which are different from the training point. And we see that yes, the error does come down quite rapidly. Perhaps even more encouraging is the orange line, which is the error estimate. So this is an error estimate that can be computed in an online efficient manner. And we see that the error estimate is quite effective in the sense that it predicts the true, true error in a reduced order model, even though this is invoked at test set, which are different from the training set. Now we can talk a little bit more, more about computational cost. To characterize that, I'm going to use a wall clock time associated with a single finite element solve on the adapted mesh as a single time unit. So this doesn't involve the time required to perform actual adaptation, just solving the problem on that final optimized mesh. Now in terms of total fine cost, it requires about 60 times a single solve of the finite element. Much of the cost comes from performing this adaptive DG approximation for all of the snapshots and making sure each one of those snapshots are accurate. And second dominant cost comes from this uh, identification of the reduced quadrature rule using this training algorithm. But once we pay that, we achieve significant speed up in the online stage. If we want to just evaluate the output, speed up is in, in the order of 22,000 in world clock time. If we want to evaluate both output and error estimate, it's about 21,000. Now in terms of CPU speed up, it's even greater because there's certain parallel efficiency loss for these small reduced order model when we try to use many cores. So that was basically a, um, kind of the um, set of tools we use to construct these reduced order models. So now I'd like to briefly talk about a number of different applications of this class of method. So first is the extension to moderate and high dimensional problems. Um, assumption that I'm going to make is that the problem is still reducible in a sense that even if the extrinsic dimension is large, the intrinsic dimension is still small. Even if we make this assumption though, um, there are a number of challenges. 
So first of all, we have to ensure that the model is accurate for all training set, uh, training parameters, sorry, all parameters in this high dimensional space. And second of all, we have to control the offline training cost when you're training in this high dimensional space. And I think one way to approach this problem is to adaptively construct this training parameter set such that we can tackle these moderate to high dimensional problems. Okay, so what we want to do, so there are two goals. So first of all, we want our training set that sufficiently covers this high dimensional space, but at the same time, we want to make sure that our training time doesn't blow up because we are using a very large training set. And we combine three ingredients to address this challenge. So first of all, we use this online efficient error estimate. As I mentioned, our ROM achieves order of thousand plus speed up. So that means that we can use sampling point, maybe a thousand points or so in the parameter space without too much issues. Second is that we are going to adaptively refine this training set during the greedy iteration such that we can focus the sampling, um, sampling the region of the parameter space that has large errors. And lastly, we are going to perform adaptive enrichment of these hyper-reduced training points such that we can construct a reduced order model efficiently. So I'd like to show an example of this for a uh, uncertainty quantification of the RANGS flow. So we are here looking at the flow over a uh, RA2822 airfoil. And our parameters are seven dimensional. So it's a moderate dimensional problems. And these are the parameters associated with the spalatal Maras turbulence model. What we would like to do is to understand how the variability in these parameters affect the drug prediction. Now, one thing I would like to emphasize is that in the context of UQ, it is important to control the discretization error in a careful manner such that we don't conflate the error due to the model and the error due to the discretization. For this reason, we are going to actually control the discretization error to be less than 1% for all parameter values, even though the actual variation in the drug for this particular problem tends to be around 20%. So let's take a look at how it works. So again, we are trying to control all sources of error in terms of the finite element error using adaptive scheme. We can reduce the error from 23% to about 0.25% with a fairly small increase in the number of degrees of freedom. And on the right, I'm showing you the training history for this reduced basis approximation. So this silver line corresponds to the maximum error obtained on the adaptively chosen training set, which is about 400 points. And we see that it terminates after about 24 basis functions are chosen. Number of degrees of freedom goes down from about 64,000 to 24. Quadrature point goes down from 104,000 to about 500. Now we can check if this method in fact solved the high dimensional problem correctly. Checking it on a set of test points. Here we use test set of 20 test points and plot the worst case error. Blue line again corresponds to the worst error and we can see that error actually does come down. And in fact, it is bounded by the error obtained over the training set. Orange curve corresponds to the error estimate. So again, error estimate works quite well, even though the, even in this high dimensional space. And this is one of the key ingredients that allows us to explore high dimensional space relatively efficiently. Now, in terms of training cost, I have to admit that it is quite expensive. Overall training cost is about 200 times just a single finite element solve. Um, we are trying to improve this computational cost right now. But in terms of the online acceleration, we achieve about a factor of 300 speed up, including the evaluation of this error estimate, which is quite accurate. We can extend this to time dependent problems as well. So here we are going to look at an example of flow past a Naka 0012 airfoil. Equations lamina navia stokes angle of attack is very high, 20 degrees. That's why the flow is separated. We are going to treat Reynolds number as a parameter. And our output of interest is time averaged drug. Now, in terms of methodology, everything we talked about can be extended to these unstudied problems. So we can still use the greedy type training 
to construct reduced basis space, except now we are going to combine that with P or D. We can also use this type of sparse quadrature identification technique. And finally, for error estimation and control, we appeal to space-time formulation and AMP study adjoint. So for this particular problem, adjoint looks something like this. So it's solved backward in time, and it still tells us which region of the flow is most important to compute the quantity of interest accurately. So let's take a look at how this method works. Again, we perform adaptive mesh refinement to control the finite element error. On the right, I'm showing you the change in the reduced basis error. And in this case, we just need three training points over the Reynolds number space and error goes down and meet the user prescribed target error tolerance. In terms of the size of the model, it goes down from about 160,000 to 42. Number of quadrature points goes down from 320,000 to about 1,000. So we achieve rapid convergence over the training set. In terms of prediction performance, it's not quite as good as what we see for the um, steady state problems. So blue line corresponds to actual error, orange line corresponds to error estimate. Notice that the error estimate is not quite as sharp as what we have seen for the steady state problem. Nevertheless, it's still indicative of the error we have. In terms of speed up, we achieve about the factor of 330 speed up in wall clock. And if we want to also compute the error estimate, speed up is about a factor of 240. Now, once we have this type of unsteady problem capability, we can also use the other applique. Oh, sorry, one more slide. So this is just a, a time instantaneous history of drag and lift. And we see that it can predict these quantities. I should note that instantaneous quantity approximation typically is not as good as time averaged quantity approximation, but nevertheless, it is around 2% for this case. Now, once we have this kind of uh, um, unsteady flow simulation capability, we can also try to use it in the context of data assimilation. So here the goal is to combine imperfect nonlinear dynamical model and noisy, sparse, and incomplete data to estimate state of physical system. One example we all know is with a prediction where we combine, say, a with global circulation model and with a station data to predict the state. What we would like to do is to bring such a capability to engineering systems. And the emphasis here is that we wanna make sure that data simulation methods can meet practical turnaround and resource demands of engineering setting. We can't afford to run the simulation on say thousands of cores consistently. So we wanna really reduce the computational cost. Now, one way to solve this problem is to use ensemble Kalman filter. So here we basically, this is an ensemble method. So initially estimate the error using Monte Carlo type approximation. And then we generate initial set of approximations. In the forecast stage, we are going to propagate each one of these guys forward in time okay, until we take the measurement at this point. And when we take the measurement, we update the state and that's called the analysis stage. Now, one of the key to computing this update correctly is that we have to compute the Kalman gain accurately. And computing the Kalman gain accurately means that we have to compute these covariances accurately. And the accuracy of the covariance depends on the size of the um, ensemble that we are using. So in order for ensemble Kalman field that work well, we have to use sufficiently large number of ensemble such that we can compute the covariance correctly, but obviously the computational cost goes up as we try to use large number of ensemble. So what we would like to do is to replace much of these ensemble with a uh, reduced order model approximation. And that's the idea behind the multi-level ENKF based on full order model and the reduced order model. So we run the full order model to compute the solutions. We train the ROM using those full order model samples and then we run a whole bunch of ROM simulations. And then at the analysis stage, we are going to incorporate data, perform multi-level update that incorporates information from form, ROM, and observations. And then again, perform form solution, form update, retrain the ROM, 
perform the ROM solutions and so on. So, and then update the state again at the next time step. Now, I'd like to illustrate how this particular method works. We are going to look at the same problem, but now we are going to treat initial condition as uncertain. Okay? And then random output uh, uh, uncertain. And then we are going to basically take observation ab about every, every one fourth oscillation period. So this is a preliminary result, but this is typically how data simulation method work. So this is relative L2 error against the time. And this is a result obtained using 64 full order model samples. So this is about as good as it gets. Every time we make that takes a measurement, error goes down and the error slowly converges. For this particular case, I'm also showing the shaded region because the performance of the filter changes. There's some randomness in the filter. So I'm showing you the performance we obtain for the 10% um, uh, within the 10 to 90% percent percentile. This is about as well as we get, but this method is very expensive because we have to solve the full order model 64 times. If we try to reduce that and just use four solves, you can see that the performance gets far worse than where it was. So this is cheap, but not as well. If we use eight instead, again, it's cheap, um, but still doesn't perform that well. But if we use multi-level method, we get basically this purple curve. Now the cost for using this multi-level method is comparable to this M equals eight approximation, which is shown in the yellow line. But notice that in terms of the error, it achieves error comparable to the MH equals 64 case, except towards the very end. So what this multi-level acceleration allows us to do is to basically reduce the computational cost required to achieve a given accuracy. So this is just one application of the ROM in the context of ensemble-based data assimilation. Okay, so that basically concludes my talk. Um, so in today's talk, we talked about goal-oriented ROM for nonlinear PDs based on this adaptive high-order method, reduced basis approximation, dual-weighted residual error estimate, and this empirical quadrature procedure hyper-reduction. And really the emphasis was to quantify and control various sources of the error. And in our case, we consider the control of the finite element error, reduced basis error, as well as the error due to the use of reduced quadrature rule. And the goal was that user can just supply the target tolerance and the entire training process should be automated. And I showed an example of this type of technology for parameter and design sweep, uncertainty quantification, and study flows, and data assimilation. So thank you very much for coming to the talk, and I can take uh, any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the great talk, Masa. I, I really loved it. Um, I mean, I, I, I should say I, I especially love your point-wise um, RQ method. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, knowing more more about that. Okay, let's do uh, have a Q and A sessions. Uh, we do have questions from the the chat room. In Emmanuel uh, from Emmanuel. Um, yes, the, how close the the parameters used in the simulations are to actual values. The, the reduction seems uh, always to be related to spatial coordinates. Would we look at the Fourier components of the fields involved in a spectral method approach? I I, I think that. Okay. What he meant by spectral method is a um, uh, okay. singular value, um, I guess. I'd... Okay, let's see. Yeah, I'm seeing the, I just opened the chat so I can read this as well. Yeah. So, uh, how close the parameters using simulations are to actual values? Uh, For the prediction case, I guess. Oh, I see. Okay, I understand. Yes. Okay. So, so points are chosen randomly whenever I do test. So very much the how far they are depends on the extent of the parameter space. Um, so, uh, right, so for example, uh, let's see. So the earlier example we looked at, yes, for example, Mach number 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 and angle of attack of zero to three. When I do test, I'm just choosing points randomly. So 
I think uh, in this case, I was choosing probably like five points or so to test randomly the points. So mm -hmm. the distance is entirely um, based on the, the choice of the parameter domain. And I'm always plotting the worst case error. So the largest error obtained at the largest, um, the largest error obtained over the test set. Uh, so that's and that the, largest error is less than 1% on combining. Right. That, 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 that was always my goal. Yes, that's yeah. correct. Uh, reduction exactly. seems to be always related to spatial coordinate. Um, could we look at prior components of the field involved in a spectral method approach? So this is a very, uh, very interesting question. So there's, uh, I think, very tight connection between spectral method and types of reduced basis method that uh, I presented today, or we have been seeing in these uh, GDPS seminars. Um, I think one key difference is that uh, um, in spectral method, the basis functions are still constructed in a program, in a sense, problem agnostic manner. It's these are polynomial spaces that can in general approximate any function that might, you know, it might encounter. Here, I think the emphasis is on, is on the fact that we are using empirical or tailored basis in the sense that these basis functions are targeted for the particular parametric variation that problem exhibit. So um, I, think, I think there's a very tight connection. I've never actually looked at uh, the spectrum for these, uh, these uh, for example, these, uh, these particular reduced basis, but there's certainly a connection between the two. Uh, but physics is involved when you're using dimensions. Frequency. Yes, so I completely agree with this remark. So in a way, this type of approximation, you know, it's not treating all the features in the same manner. Things like, you know, boundary layer plays an important role. So um, in a sense, I think emphasis, more emphasis is placed on those particular features. I don't know if I'm doing a particularly good job answering the questions, but uh, hopefully that was okay. He, he okay, says thank thumbs you. up. <laughs> Okay, so you did a good job. Okay, <laughs> next question uh, is from Han. Uh, okay. He asked, uh, the adjoint equation is uh, yeah. quantitatively interesting dependent, right? Uh, what yeah. if we care yeah. only the global error norm instead of a specific quantity of interest? Can we still formulate the adjoint equation? So no, so in that case, adjoint wouldn't be the, uh, um, I guess the right, approach to the problem we want to use as you say you know if you have more of the energy norm type quantity then we might want to use more of the energy type um error uh, error estimate and control say h1 norm of the error or something like that um one thing i wanted to emphasize here though is that the, we, we focused on quantity of interest because in things like aerodynamic flows those are the things people typically care about things like lift and drag and so on so that was um, um, I guess our emphasis in this particular talk, uh, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, different formulation would be required to control global error. And in fact, we've actually done that in some other works. Um, for example, if you are looking at, you know, more of the elasticity type problems and so on, you know, the, there you might actually have things like, you know, the, total strain energy error and so on that might be that might be a little more engineering relevant so we have also done work in that area as well but uh, um, I didn't really talk about this in this talk here I really focused on aerodynamics and controlling the error due to uh, some quantity of interest or right. error in quantity of interest yeah that's great I think for the uh, excellent answer um, Okay, I don't uh, see any more questions from uh, the chat room, but I do have some questions. While I'm asking questions, you guys can um, uh, post your question in chat room. So, so um, well, obviously, the point-wise IQ uh, method is, is a lot more efficient than element-wise IQ. Mm -hmm. uh, I can definitely see that. Um, have you compared um, have you done some comparison uh, between the element-wise IQ with a some some other hyperreduction technique like like a DIM and Gannett, etc.? Yeah, so that's that's an excellent question. So no, we haven't done explicit comparison. Um, but what I can say is that basically um, all of the 
algebraic based reduction methods, so things like DIM, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, they all require, they work at the algebraic level yeah, in, in yeah. the end, right? So all of those methods, yeah. in a sense, have to work with element as a working unit effectively because you still have to be able to compute the residual associated with a full order model degrees of freedom, which means yeah. that you do still have to perform integration over elements and so on. So right. that limitation of having to work with elements still uh, still exists in this type of uh, discrete or any algebraic type hyper reduction methods. And I feel that we have to peel basically one level deeper in the sense that go one, one, one more level intrusive to, uh, to you know, do pointwise type uh, approximation if we want to our method to work really well for high order approximation because you know, like high order approximation, in, especially in a three dimensional space, single yes. element can contain, you know, a lot of degrees of freedom, right? So that, that's, that's basically the um, limitation we have, um, at least for this DG type method. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that's really relevant to what we are uh, trying to solve at, at LNNL. Uh, do, do you know MFEM, by the way? Um, it's it's the M MFEM. Um, it's the software, uh, the higher yeah. order finite element uh, software uh, developed at Lawrence Livermore. Yes, here. yes, I think I think you actually mentioned this to me before, and uh, yeah. So here, um, I'm not really building on MFEM here. I'm I'm just yeah, using yeah, the like, in-house uh, DG solver. But uh, I mean, obviously, the concept discussed here applies to any high order method as well, right? So yeah. right, right. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I might uh, want to introduce you to um, some of the MFM teams. Um, okay. here at, um, maybe you guys can um, collaborate on a full order model um, size, um, just in terms of the high, uh, high order finite element and DG method. Um, there might be some um, way collaboration, future collaboration can be done. Uh, between yeah, I, 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 I'd actually. be very excited. Yes, certainly. Yes, please let me know. Yeah. I'm sure they will be interested in knowing more about your work. Okay, so while we are talking, uh, another question from uh, Okay, Lee Reza, the split between full order model error and reduced model error uh, tolerance was 0.5% each if the goal is very rapid online computation and offline cost is less significant. Seems to make sense to change the limits so that form limit is lower yeah. And wrong limit is higher. Please. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a good point. I've kind of arbitrarily chosen the split of 0.5% for both. But yes, depending on exactly where the emphasis is, for example, if you cared more about creating the smallest ROM, then yes, you might actually reduce the form error uh, such that you can commit a little more ROM errors and so on. Um, here we didn't really do any optimization of that kind. Um and in the end, it doesn't make that significant of difference only because error tends to go down exponentially with n. So um, that convergence is quite fast. So difference between 0.5% and 1% might not be that significant. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Great. Yeah, he's smiling. <laughs> so that's great. Um, all right. Um, so um, I'm, you're not doing uh, any adaptive refinements. Um, I mean, so you, you, you're doing the adaptive refinements. Um, uh, you're not doing adaptive refinements. Let me rephrase. You're, <laughs> you're not doing adaptive refinements um, in unsteady, uh, like in time marching uh, uh, sense, right? Well, uh, so I'm not doing any online adaptive refinement, not the kind of right, stuff right, like, right. You know, like Kevin did. Um, I'm not doing yeah. that. But uh, mesh refinement itself, we do do it. So I guess it's kind of hard to see. Maybe I need to maximize this again. But uh, yeah, so the same principle applies. We can still use dual weighted residual method and compute the error and then perform adaptation. So you know you can see that the uh, elements are refined in a selective manner. I guess. Uh, yeah, that that is for the steady problem. But I, I was oh, no. talking about on, on oh, no, this is a was... study problem. This is a oh, study is... problem. Oh, yeah, this is a study problem. Oh, indeed, um, yes, yes. Yes, but one thing we don't do is that we don't, we use, we perform mesh refinement, but in the end, we use the same mesh for all time snapshots, um, just so that we can simplify the computation of, uh, 
you know, POD and so on uh, yeah, over time. Yeah. So it's not dynamic. It's a, it's a static mesh, uh, but it is refined in, uh, uh, it is refined in adaptive manner. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay. Well, how about that in dynamic sense? The, uh, um, let's say you, the adaptive refinement has been done in dynamic sense and... Um, it, yeah, so the only, it's not really a huge challenge, but if you do dynamic refinement, then each one of the snapshot can potentially lie in a different, on a different mesh, right? So in order to actually perform things like POD, you have to work on a common mesh. So you might have to yeah. construct at least a pair or pairwise common mesh to compute all the inner product associated with POD. Um, we've done this for, uh, um, it's much simpler problems, 2D problems and so on, but uh, uh, right now we don't do this for aerodynamic flows, partially because when you support an isotropic mesh refinement where you don't just refine the isotropic manner, but like you might split in one direction only and so on, uh, it becomes much more difficult to solve this pairwise matching problem. So um, we, we are not really doing that. Um, I don't think there's any conceptual or mathematical challenge to doing that. Um, it's just mechanics. We don't we don't have the mechanics to do it. So yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, maybe one last question. In slide thirty one, um, you mentioned that you you're trying to uh, improve the offline cost. Um, yeah. And um, can you um. Can you uh, discuss a, a little bit what, what's the approach you are taking right now to improve that offline cost? Yeah, so, so number number of different things. So, so, so first of all, I think what I presented here is not really optimized in any way. So the, I mean, the fact still remains that uh, we have to use you know, a relatively large training set because it's a high dimensional space. I don't think there's a really good way to cover it using a small number of sets. So that fact remains. Mm -hmm. But there are things we can do in terms of, for example, so hyper reduction right now is actually quite extensive in a sense that, uh, especially in high dimensional space, when you have lots of training points, uh, identifying this reduced quadrature rule becomes quite expensive. So we're trying to improve both the, just the, not just the speed, but also the accuracy of that process. So we're trying to make it a little more robust. And I think those actually small things can make quite a bit of difference. For even higher dimensional spaces, uh, we might actually need to consider more formal dimensionality reduction. So reduction of the parameter space before you do the reduction of the, um, well, the, the reduction of the parameter space itself. But we haven't really, um, looked too much into it or integrated that with the rest of our um, um, greedy algorithms and so on. So um, yeah, very okay. much work in progress. I just wanted to note that this is not certainly not a solved problem. I know many people work on high dimensional problems and uh, um, there's still a lot of challenge there, I think. Um, yeah, I totally understood. Um, I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, know uh, what approach you're, no. uh, you're taking to solve that challenging problem um <laughs> all right yeah, sounds good yeah the yeah. other big challenge is you know transonic flows flows with shocks you know you talked about this in the last ddps seminar uh, and you know yeah. people like matt and Tomas also i think talked about in the earlier seminars as well i think that's a huge huge problem uh we are just starting to uh get into that but uh nothing to show yet so yeah I see. I see. All right. Um, if if you have anything to show, please let me know so that I I can invite you again. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Youngsu, and thank you everybody for coming to the talk. So yeah. Thank you, Masa. Thank you so much for the great talk. Um, I hope I'm I'm sure uh, the audiences uh, have enjoyed your talk. Right now, uh, a lot of people left already because it's past uh, past right. uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. the seminar time. But I'm sure they enjoyed it. Well, uh, with that, let's conclude uh, our uh, DDPS seminar uh, talk today. Uh, thank you so much, Masa, again. And, no, thank you, young sir. It was uh, nice seeing you. you as well. Bye-bye. Yeah, and thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, well, Masa, I...